Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bible Study That Doesn't Suck. This is Pastor Megan Rohr. I am in San Francisco at Grace Evangelical Lutheran Church in the Sunset, where we have worship every Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, and on live stream if you go to gracesf.com. And I am Pastor Amanda Zentz, and I'm coming to you live from Central Lutheran Church in Northeast Portland, Oregon, where we have worship every Sunday at 10.15 in the morning and with education at 9 o'clock. If you are listening to this uh, the week of sep before September 14th, please know that this week will be a different week. We are going to be the church in the world. We're taking the church outside the building, and we will be gathering at 10 o'clock and heading out into the city to do service projects for our worship. And then we'll be returning to have communion together in the fellowship hall. So this is the one week where things will be a little different. If you show up at 1015, don't worry. We'll have a project here waiting for you, uh, baking cookies. So it will be a good time. I want cookies. Maybe the project should be sending Pastor Megan some of the cookies you bake. <laughs> They're going to a local homeless ministry. All right, that's better. I know. <laughs> but if you have any broken ones, just put them in a tin. <laughs> All right, maybe not. All right, well, for our first for our first reading of Bible study that doesn't suck is um, one of the texts from Exodus, and part of this reading, should your congregation choose it, remember we, we use the texts that come from a lectionary, which is a three-year cycle chosen by old white guys a long, long time ago. Um, and this, this week, as many weeks, you have a choice of what Old Testament text you pick. You can pick a text from Exodus about... Um, Noah, or you can pick a text from Genesis about Joseph and his brothers. Um, and um, just because I have it and it's fun, I'm going to take a second and show you a, a little video of the Exodus text because I think it's fun. Um, so let's check this out. Can you see that up there? Okay, here we go. Is it playing? Yeah, can you hear it? Nope. No? Okay. Well, if you can't hear it, I'll show you where it's at later. I'll put a link um, below, and you can watch it. How much fun is it to sh show you a video when you can't even hear it? Well, but if it's on your screen, I'm guessing that they can see and hear it for those who are watching. Yeah, but you couldn't see and hear it, right? That's okay. That's goofy. Someone's playing the piano right now, and I don't know who they are. The end. The end. <laughs> could you hear that? Could you hear the piano? I could hear the piano. Okay. So I'll put a link down here of the fun Bible study that doesn't suck reading. You can watch um, the Pharaoh get thrown into the sea and all the fun stuff that goes with that. Some of my um, highlights of, of things that I find are really interesting when I look at this Bible study is um, the fact that God will only speak to Moses when the people grumble, God responds to Moses, not to the people who are grumbling. This could be because Moses has a special relationship. Um, it, it's not in the text, but it's fun to imagine that maybe Moses is schizophrenic um, because schizophrenic people can hear the voice of God, and normally we don't listen to them. So how cool would it be if this was an, a time when someone who was schizophrenic was able to help save a group of people and, and get them out of slavery. Most of the only times we hear about people with schizophrenia on the news are when they've done something terrible. Um, I happen to have worked with a lot of people with schizophrenia in my ministry, and I, I think it's interesting because they might be some of the only prophets able and willing to admit that they hear the voice of God. Um, and so if we are going to hear the voice of God in today's world, we would need someone who's willing enough to confess that they've heard that voice. I don't know if I would have the guts to admit that I had it. We were joking at Bible study today here at Grace um, that if I was joking that if we had a burning bush out front that told us what God wanted us to do, it would be both a blessing and a curse. One, it'd be a blessing because we'd know for sure that God exists and wants to talk to us and that this is in fact a sacred place. But it would be a a difficult thing because usually when God speaks to you it means you have a long voyage to go on. This voyage lasts 40 years and they never saw the promised land. Um, you have to eat the same food over 
and over again. It's not that much fun. And most of the time, the people who have interactions with God are a little bit grumpy about it. This, in, in this text, when they're going through the sea, the, the burning fire is there, um, and it's at the back of the Israelites. So if you wonder why, the, why didn't the, the chariots that had wheels ever catch up to the people who are walking as they walk through the Dead Sea, um, it's because in the text there's this big flame, and it's God separating the army people from the Israelites so they don't um, interact with each other, so they're kept back by the flames. And then at the front of the Israelites is this cloud that is gleaming with light. And the light kind of leads their way of where to walk. Maybe it was like a fog. Um, we don't know, but their walking happens um, seemingly in the night time. So it would be a way for them to see where they're going and to have some protection and to not have another army from the front um, kind of ambush them, assuming if there were um, predators on the other side. But I love that there's a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, right? And so you can think of this as rough and tumbly fiery God and soft and cuddly cloud God. Um, of course, these aren't different aspects of God. These are all parts of, of God's personality. But in this storytelling, there's the cloud and then there's the fire. And I think it's, it's just an amazing thing to think about being protected on all sides from someone who loves you. Um, and, and just a really interesting... An interesting way to think about it. I also think it's kind of interesting that once they cross to the other side and the water washes over the Pharaoh and the, and the army, that they see their dead bodies washed to shore, so they know for sure that they're killed, and this is like a really yucky, bloody story. And then their response to this, um, they don't go, yay, we're saved. Uh, they actually sing a song. It's Miriam who sings a song, and she sings about the horse and rider being thrown in the sea and um, God providing victoriously. And, and so I, I just think it's really interesting. It's not the only time in, our, in the Hebrew scripture that women sing songs. In fact, they think that the oldest thing ever written in the Bible is a poem. It was either a poem or a song written in the book of Judges. Um, about a woman named Yael, and it was also a military poem. Perhaps it's because when you have a big military victory, you want to commemorate it, like we have all these statues around with guys on horses all over San Francisco, and we don't even remember what battle they fought in, but there's this desire to commemorate military victories, so maybe it's that military victories are being celebrated. This other... Um, oldest text in the book of Judges is Yael is this wife of a military leader and all the men of their town are off fighting the evil bad people that they're fighting at that particular time and it turns out because they have all of these very strict rules of hospitality that say that if someone ever comes to your house you have to take care of them you need to provide them with protection you should give them milk and you should um, Make sure that they are safe. That's your number one duty. And um, so the, the opposing military general knows about these rules of hospitality and tries to use them to take advantage of this village. And so the other army's general comes to try to stay in Yael's tent. And she welcomes him in, provides him with milk, tucks him into bed. We don't know if she tucked him. But she puts him to sleep. And while she's asleep, she drives a tent peg through his head, like you do. Um, and, and this is a time when a woman uses the tools that she would have been very familiar with, because if you kind of think of the way Native Americans moved along, um, they were a kind of a group that would set up tents wherever they lived, and the, the women were the ones who would put the tents together. So she was very strong and steady with her tent peg, um, but she was able to provide her victory. So it's kind of cool that the oldest, possibly the oldest text in our Hebrew scripture is the story of a woman who won a war. When, when met some people read the scriptures and think that it says that women uh, aren't allowed to do stuff. Um, so I think that's fun. 
and and this is another example of a woman who's singing a song about a victorious battle, um, and a really good way for me to mention Miriam's name, um, because Amanda really likes to talk about Miriam. It's true. I do like to talk about Miriam because she's um, she's a powerful woman who actually made it all the way through our patriarchal history and is still named in the Bible. And what is um, wonderfully unique about this situation is that Miriam is seen here leading worship. Um, this is an absolute worship form uh, that happens, and and she is the leader. And so, in modern culture, where we may be celebrating a few decades of women in ordained leadership, sometimes it's good to remember that throughout history there have been other times where uh, women have had different roles in religious leadership, um, on leadership on the battlefield, uh, leadership in lots of different ways. So. Miriam's a pretty awesome figure, and she leads a great, a great dance and a great song here. Yay, Miriam! Yay. You're great. You're done good. Um, but I also think it's um, when you check out the the video, uh, you can see that I think it's a little bit jarring. Like my first response when I see dead bodies in the water isn't "Let's sing a song," um, but they just want to. A battle, and I think if we think of some of the coolest hymns that we have in worship services today, it's songs that came out of the kind of faith that helped people um, survive slavery, or the kinds of songs that came after the joyous celebration of their slavery being over. And so, um, yay for that! And you have to. I think it's it it's a very interesting thing to look at this as a recognition of. Um, freedom at the time. You know, they just came through this huge ordeal of all these plagues, and there has been a tremendous amount of death prior to this. So, um, right or not, uh, what we like to hear or not, seeing the, seeing, we are human creatures, and vengeance is in our hearts takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of effort to not hold vengeance in our hearts. And we often fail at not holding that. And so for those who have been through this horrid ordeal of generations of slavery um, and who have had, you know, Miriam grew up in a time where her brother should have been killed, where many of her you know, many of those of her generation were thrown into the Nile and killed on a whim by the Pharaoh. So she's seen floating dead bodies of infants and children in her lifetime. So whether she had a heart that could forgive that or move on from that, I don't know that I could have that. Um, and they are a, a people who have been through battles that few of us in the United States have been through. Those who serve in the military, those who come from other lands um, have an exposure to this, but I know I certainly do not have an exposure to what it's like to live in an actual war-torn area where children are used as the pawns of battle. Um, I think that's happening all over our world right now, but we in the United States are sometimes shielded from that reality. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's true, and I I think that it's um, it's really good storytelling symmetry as well to have the pharaoh and the pharaoh's army drowned in the water because if you remember from a couple of weeks ago, it was Moses in the little basket um, because the rule that the pharaoh had said was that all of the Israelites needed to be drowned in the water, and so it's kind of like karma. I mean, if you want to put it down to that, but it's it's. It's good storytelling. It's great, great symmetry. And it's a great importance. This this piece of the story is of great importance to uh, to the historical faith. And I think that, you know, for those who are interested in kind of seeing one of the rooting stories of of Judaism, that this is a this is a place to understand that a, a lot of their understanding is that they have. I should not speak too much. I'm not a scholar, but but 
it comes so much back to this over and over their storytelling, the rituals, the, uh, those pieces come back to this story of Moses leading them out and leading them through the sea. Um, this is a huge moment in Jewish history. And I'm going to go visit there in uh, in January. Um, I'm, I'm having some, think of it as the pastor's amazing race. Um, my partner Laurel and I are going to go to visit all of the seven wonders of the world. And so in January, um, we'll be going to Jordan to see Petra um, and also spending some time in, in the Holy Land and going to visit the pyramids because um, I like all of the cartoons and imagery of of um, and the brash idea that the Israelites were the ones who built the pyramids. So I think that will be fun. But I think we'll also, on our uh, on our way from Petra to to float in the in the Dead Sea, take a stop at the Red Sea kind of on our on our looped way around and so it'll be fun to see where that spot is to is believed to be for that for that journey we'll we'll see right now apparently there's a lot of very beautiful uh, fish and and reefs that you can check out so I'll look for chariots if I see any I'll take a picture and, and I'll let you know I have a feeling if they were made of wood it would have been too long ago to find them so looking on towards our Genesis text, yes. for those who have chosen to go with the Genesis text, which does play quite nicely with our gospel text for today, we hear a section of um, the story about Joseph. You may be familiar with the story of Joseph from Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Uh, this is that character who, whose brothers sell him into slavery when he's young who is kind of the, the the favorite, his daddy's favorite son, and um, is a bit of an upstart as a young one. He has dreams where he says, oh, you're all going to bow down to me because I'm like the cool one. And his dad is like, yeah, and gives him this coat of many. Um, he's really kind of set above his other brothers. So, of course, what his older brothers do, who are kind of bored and don't like this upstart of a kid, they sell him into slavery. So in Genesis, we get this wonderful story about Joseph and how he handles this time in slavery and what happens to him. Um, some fascinating stories with a gentleman named Potiphar and his wife. Um, and then into prison he goes. And there's some interesting stories about uh, a baker and a wine steward. And uh, finally, eventually, Joseph becomes uh, Pharaoh's right-hand person. So this is before, this is part of how the people of Israel get to Egypt is the story in Genesis. And so uh, Joseph becomes the, the right-hand guy of the Pharaoh, who at the time is not the Pharaoh of the Exodus story that we just heard and have been talking about, but is an earlier Pharaoh. And um, there's a huge drought in the land, and uh, everyone is starving. But Joseph saw that this was going to be happening. And so he had, he was like a really good urban planner and worked ahead and took these seven years of great harvest and stocked stuff up so that the kingdom, the, the land of Egypt would have plenty to eat throughout the years of famine and drought. And so as the other countries around Egypt don't have anything, uh, Joseph's brothers come to this land where there is plenty and ask for help. And Joseph recognizes them as his brothers who had sold him into slavery and who had told his father that he was dead. And um, so there is um, fascinating stories of their reconnection and how Joseph handles that reconnection um, and how the brothers handle it. There's some deception going on about Joseph gets to play with them a little bit because they don't recognize him at all. So he gets to play with them a little bit and trick them into things. And he meets his younger brother from the same mother and um, kind of slips a chalice into his saddlebag so he can arrest him and keep him. And the older brothers are freaking out because it's not like him to steal things. And how are we going to tell our dad that we've lost another brother? And there's some really fun bits of this story. So if you're looking for a good read, this is a section of the Bible that's not too intimidating um, and is a good plot line and a fun storyline that if you're more familiar with kind of plot line stories uh, as opposed to a bunch of lists and rules and things that you should and shouldn't do, 
this is a great section of the Bible to be reading. So what we have in this section of our text today is a section where the brothers, Joseph has had his fun, and I think it's important to kind of point that out. Joseph has had his fun. He's had a little bit of um, his own vengeance in a way. And um, finally, the brothers, knowing who he is, ask for forgiveness. And Joseph is at a point where um, he says, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And God has been able to use this for good. And there's forgiveness and, and the family moves forward. Um, so two things about this. One, this can be an, a, an incredibly powerful text um, for someone years after a great trauma who has come to terms with their trauma and has um, walked through their own personal sense of reconciliation, forgiveness, and found peace within themselves from their trauma to be able to look at Joseph's example and say, what other people have intended for evil, what they did to hurt and harm me, I am able with God's help to use in good ways and in helpful ways that build up community and give back to the world. It is not helpful nor useful to tell people in the midst of their trauma that God intended their trauma for good. Um, it is not helpful or useful to those who have not reconciled and found peace, to those who are still hurting and in pain, to be told that God's intention was for them to experience this pain in order to help other people. Um, it takes time. Joseph had many, many, many years. It takes a change in status. Joseph has a tremendous amount of power in this text. It takes opportunity to feel as if you are in control of things again. Joseph taking advantage of his younger brother and doing playing his kind of games there at the beginning. You know, he, he had that healing process. Those pieces were there prior to him saying this. So as you, as you interact with this, for those who have had these kinds of experiences of great trauma and who are able to um, use that trauma later in life, um, I think of those who've grown up in the foster system, who experienced great trauma through the foster system, who then become child rights advocates. Um, for them, as an adult who is stable, stable housing, stable family, stable income, um, places of power, security, those kinds of situations, then they can take their experience and use it for good. But um, it, is, it is one of those ways in which Christians can abuse one another when we tell someone in the midst of their trauma God means this to make you stronger, or God is God uses this. God's doing this to just make you a better person. God is doing this to make you a stronger person. Um, that's not helpful, and it's not true. God doesn't intend harm to any of us. God walks with us in places of harm and gives us the strength to get through one way or another. And God is with us all the time and what is intended for evil can sometimes be used for good way down the road so enough Megan yeah what I would say um, because this text is one I've sat with for quite some time because it was the text used at our reconciling service when um, for 20 plus years um, the the Lutheran Church wasn't able yet to recognize gay and lesbian pastors as leaders um, then in 2010 they had a service to reconcile those of us who have been serving for a long time to like say huh ah, sorry about that well that was said later um, but but to have a uh, let's have a big celebration and welcome you back as pastors into this place now that we can do that and and we after a lot of thought and and a lot of voting um, picked this verse to be our Old Testament text because the forgiveness doesn't happen like if you listen to Amanda's version it kind of sounds like yay forgiveness um, but I'm not sure that Joseph does forgive his brothers I in fact uh, believe he doesn't 
forgive them. Um, what happens in this text is that they weep on each other. Um, and maybe that means that they've forgiven each other, or maybe it means that they're so tired of words, that words can't provide the kind of reconciliation that they need. But there's something about sharing tears um, that can unite people in a family. If you've ever been with a family who, where you just can't fix it, you can't talk about it, but you can cry all at the same time, and it doesn't bring anyone back to life, it doesn't make you not have so sold your brothers into slavery, it doesn't mean you've forgotten all of the painful things in the past, it doesn't mean you're ever going to get to a point of forgiving someone. Um, anyone who's ever had someone in their family who's had a lot of addiction issues, um, and maybe there's been a, an attempt to make amends, but you're not all there yet, or if there's been abuse in a family, um, sexual or, or physical, sometimes you just never get there, but you agree to be in the same space together, and that's enough. That's as much as you can do. Um, I also noticed that what the brothers are wondering, the brothers are wondering if Joseph is only willing to be in relationship with them because of their shared love of their father. And if you've ever been in, in a family situation where people are fighting, but due to their shared love of a grandmother or one particular person, people are able to kind of behave with each other. Um, and, and I see this as an opportunity where the brothers are able to agree to disagree, they're not fighting in public anymore, but they're wondering if all of the progress that they have made with each other will be lost now that Joseph's father is dead, because that was the thing holding them together. And a lot of families go through that when, when someone passes away who is really the glue of the family. Um, so it just it just kind of depends on, on how big the hurt and how big the pain is. Um, would you be able to, um, I think there's tables being shoved around in the other room. Would you be able to um, forgive someone who sold you into slavery? I don't know if I would. I have a hard enough time forgiving someone who cuts me off in traffic. So um, I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing to think about. Is it more convoluted that they forgive each other or that they don't? I don't know. Um, uh, one other interesting thing that I just want to mention is Peter Toscano, and I'll put a link down here to who Peterson is because he's an amazing, amazing, amazing um, comedian and um, playwright. He's Quaker. Um, he has a play about people who live beyond just a dualistic gender spectrum, and he particularly talks about Bible characters. Um, who have defied gender roles, whether it's a woman who's doing a job that's unexpected to them, or if it's a man like who's carrying water and is the person that Jesus is following, even though it was kind of verboten amongst the culture for men to be water carriers. Um, and his description of Joseph just tickles me. He calls, he calls Joseph's technicolor coat the equivalent of a rainbow princess dress, because um, at the time, this very flamboyant, fabulous garment was really only ever worn in, in the historical literature that we have by princesses, by women. Um, and so maybe it was a fantastic fur kind of like in Joseph, Joseph of the Technicolor um, dream coat. Maybe it was more like a, a princess dress. We don't know. There's no right answer because we don't, no one like took a snapshot and all of the cave paintings about this particular instance have vanished, um, and there's not, it, it, it's more an idea that if this is possible, um, maybe God can love you too. So if you're someone who would think it's interesting if Joseph is prancing around in a princess dress, not in like a let's laugh at him way, but in a this is the most powerful Israelite of his day who hangs out with the Pharaoh who is the most powerful person kind of on the world at this time. Um, the pharaohs were thought to kind of be God, and so if you got to be the interpreter of dreams for the pharaoh, you were kind of next to godliness in the society. And so um, imagine, imagine just for today that Joseph looks a lot like Elton John in his glory days, with big feathers and bright colors. Um, you don't lose anything in your faith to think about it. It's kind of fun. What if it was true? 
Um, so I just put that out there for those who have ever felt like the way they dressed wasn't allowed in church, um, or who maybe have a little bit of grandiose fabulousness. Um, ladies who wear fantastic Easter hats kind of are in the same vein, I think. That's what I think. Should we talk about Matthew? Oh yes. I get Pastor to show my my birthday gift from That's right. my text study group. So see, for some odd reason, people believe that I need tiaras around my birthday. Yeah, it's so odd. I know. Who would ever guess that that would be thought of? Hey, Amanda, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about um, what what it means in roller derby when you get to put on your outfit? Like, how do you decide what you want to wear? Like, what does your outfit mean in roller derby? I wonder if that has something, if that's connected to this. No? To which text? To, uh, to Joseph's, Joseph's, Joseph's fancy coat? princess dress. You know, outfits are interesting. Um, I think that, uh, and it, it's interesting in roller derby right now, after 10 years of resurgence, that there's a shift and there's kind of a dichotomy where there's some folks who really want it to stay the alternative culture with the kind of fun bout fits and the, the bout makeup and um, all of that kind of fun stuff. So booty shorts and fishnets and all that kind of stuff. Um, and those who are kind of aiming at the Olympics and wanting to be seen um, it's, it's an odd terminology because I think you can be a genuine athlete in booty shorts and fishnets, but they're wanting to be taken as, um, you know, genuine athletes and people who are uh, really careful with how they present themselves. So you'll see the kind of top, right now playoffs are happening in the roller derby world and the top teams in the world are uh, in championships and playoffs. And when you look at them, they do not look like what people expect derby girls to look like. They're wearing uniforms and, um, they're, they're looking like your normal sports team that you would see on any court on, e, on ESPN. But um, some, like, for example, Scald Eagle here from Rose City Rollers, who also skates for uh, Team USA, Eagle still has her bout face on. Her, her makeup is still on for everything. So um, that kind of stuff still goes. I think that... Um, identity stuff and and derby i it i don't know if you intentionally brought that up because my derby numbers come from our gospel text for this week oh yes i i definitely had that sort of foresight <laughs> <laughs> i posted it on facebook the other day Oops. so but no don't even my so my numbers come from we each get to choose kind of our our derby name and um our numbers but our numbers can change uh depending upon the team that we are on, because if somebody already has your numbers, you can change your numbers, but your names kind of stay the same. Um, but my number is uh, 77. And so it comes from our gospel text for today. And we do get to choose those as well. So our gospel for today, since we're moving that direction anyway, we'll use that as our segue, is gospel from Matthew chapter 18. It continues on from last week's gospel. Um, just picks up right at verse 21. We'll link it down here. Um, and the uh, gospel goes on to talk about someone who is being forgiven much and then fails to forgive someone who owes little. So a colleague of ours posted uh, the equivalence um, of the amount of money that the individuals owed and the first servant who is forgiven by his landlord, or not landlord, but the Lord who he owes money to, owes over $2 billion, $2 billion, $260 million, and is forgiven that debt amount. The second slave who owes the first slave money owes around $5,800. And the first slave refuses to forgive him. And so we have the case where he goes, it's the, the big Lord calls him back and says, I forgave you $2 billion and you couldn't give forgive 5,000. Um, and off you go into torment. And 
what I did last week here at Central is I actually read both gospel lessons and um, just one right after another. And, and it, it, this gospel lesson is hard to read in church on Sunday because it ends with people like gnashing teeth. It, it ends really, you know, you're going to be tortured and your Lord is going to torture you if you can't forgive each other. Um, so it doesn't sound like such great news. Like in the Lutheran church, we end our gospel readings with, this is the good news, the gospel of our Lord. And the people are expected to say, thanks be to God or breathe <laughs> to you, O Christ. And we've just said, you're going to be tortured for eternity Yay. if you don't forgive each other. Um, so it's, it's, one of those gospels that you kind of got to work to hear the good news in. Um, but I've been talking for several weeks about this forgiveness stuff. And I think that what I read in this is that when we don't forgive others, regardless whether or not we've received forgiveness ourselves, when we don't forgive others, we lock ourselves into a torment. We lock ourselves into a place where we are separated from, from others and we set ourselves we, we create our own prisons we create our own torture when we are unable to forgive other people um, and i think my perspective on that uh, has definitely been influenced by desmond tutu and his work in that um, i keep bringing it up but it just keeps coming up right now so um and when we when we continue to hold on to the grudge when we continue to hold on to the dark those things hold us prisoner. The other folks are free um, and we are not. Frederick Beekner has a great quote, um, a great thing that he wrote about anger and how it's this delectable meal that you can sit down and really enjoy eating every piece of the, like savoring the flavor of the anger and all of this. And at the end of the meal, you look down and you discover that the carcass that you've been eating is yourself. Mm. And it's a very powerful reminder that um, when we allow anger and bitterness and resentment and those things into ourselves, that truly it is ourselves that we harm. And it is very hard to forgive. Um, and it's not something you do quickly or easily. It takes practice. Um, but it's worth it to be set free from the prisons that we set ourselves into. So that's kind of part of what I preached on last week. Megan, if you want, you can link it down here. Um, it's up on my blog, so it's ready to be shared. Yeah, and I also, when I think of this text, I think about, um, you remember when the United States forgave the banks like a bunch of billions of dollars? I don't know, some sort of debt forgiveness loan kind of thing? And then those same banks foreclosed on everyone's houses? Uh I think I read something about that. I think I lived it. <laughs> and then there was this group. I can't remember what they were called and they wanted to occupy stuff. And and they said, that's not very fair. And at the same time that they were deciding to do this, there was this big, like, we don't want to raise the minimum wage a couple pennies. I don't know. It must have been in some other country because that doesn't sound like that would happen here. It must be, just only happens in old ancient biblical times, right? Absolutely. Totally. Wah, wah. Yeah. Just saying. Um, this also, when you think about this being Bible study, it also is supposed to um, remind you of some other ancient texts and it's supposed to remind you specifically of Abraham. Um, because Abraham, um, I've, I've spoke of this before, is the first of the people in the Old Testament who is advocating for some someone other than himself and his own family. Right? Noah in his little ark just saves his own family. Doesn't seem to put up a fuss. Um, his name actually means selfish um, in, in the ancient Hebrew because he doesn't put up a fight that other people should be saved. Doesn't try to build a bigger boat. Um, as they would say in Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat. Um, and, and so if you remember the, the, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, which most people just remember as a story about being mad at other people who aren't doing what we want them to do and not living the way that we want to, and so God, God must hate them too. Not actually a story about that. It's actually the whole point of that story is that Abraham says to God, essentially, you've got to stop destroying entire cities when just one jerk-off's doing something. Like, what if there's someone nice there? And God says, okay, 
Abraham starts with, if there are 70 nice people, will you save it? And God says, yes. Okay, if there's 60 nice people, will you save it? I'm making up numbers. He just kind of went down in progression. And he kind of gets to the point where he says, what if there's just one nice person, will you save this town? God says, yes, but does not do it. God pulls the um, lot and his wife out and ends up just saving the one because the wife turns around and turns into a pillar of salt. God said he was going to save the whole town, but really just saves Lot. No one really calls God on that, but that's the way the story works because it's God's world. And sometimes we can ask God to do stuff, and God kind of gets to do whatever God wants because it's God. Um, so this story is supposed to remind you of that kind of hospitality. Um, Jesus had a tendency to um, when he was reading biblical text, ancient the the Torah, when he was reading the Torah in the temple, and um, there's there's a time when he's reading the book of Isaiah and he's he scrolls back and forth. It was the custom to be able to tell your sermon by scrolling to different parts of, of the book. And so Jesus stands up in the temple, and he reads the parts of Isaiah that say, Feed the poor, do great things, justice is coming, and then closes it and doesn't read the part, which is like the very next verse, which is, Or else I'm going to get you, and you better do what I want, or God's going to rain down, blah, blah, blah. Jesus intentionally chooses not to read that part of the text, and it makes... you. you you kind of would imagine that everyone would go, oh, um, when he just like doesn't read that part of the text and he sits down. But he's showing himself to be a part of this much, much older tradition um, that comes from the Abrahamic line. I don't know if that's a word or how you pronounce it, but from the Abrahamic line, um, this idea that you, you look out for others and that you do things in sevens, because seven is the word that means perfect, um, and you want to look out for other people. And so in the same way that God is going to forgive the whole town if there's just a couple nice people, then we want to keep trying to forgive each other because God's going to do that for us. And um, if I had to count the number of times I've probably said a naughty word on Bible study, that doesn't suck. We'd get up to 70 times 70. Um, so we all kind of need that amount of forgiveness from God for silly things that we do all of the time. Amen. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out um, with the word seven cent seven features so prominently here um, is one of my favorite stories of a time I was having dinner with an Israeli couple and on we were all having we were all having dinner and on the news in the background was you know where bombs and missiles were going. I mean it wasn't the current crisis it was several years ago and there was a small child, maybe four-ish, and he was walking around playing with a tape measure. And he would go and he would measure someone, and they would be really like having this deep political conversation about the state of Israel and, and politics, all the things that kind of adults busy themselves with. And he would measure your shin, and he'd say, seven! And then he'd measure your nose, and he'd say, seven! And then he'd measure your ear, and he'd say seven, and he went around, and everyone he measured, everything came up to seven. And at first, I thought that this kid was bad at math, and maybe seven was his favorite number, and he just didn't know how to use a tape measure. Um, but really what was happening is that this was a child who was raised um, going to temple, and he knew that seven was the number that meant perfect. And he was declaring us all perfect in his eyes when he declared that every single part of our body was a seven. And I wish that when we looked in the mirror, we felt that way. I wish we had those kids' eyes that didn't, you know, before we started to wonder whether or not we weighed the right amount or before we started to wonder if our if our clothes matched. Like, remember when, when we used to just pick out weird, funny-looking clothes and we'd go to school in, like, Halloween costumes? Um, so... I wish that that spirit of seven um, is something that can follow you through this whole week, and if you're able through the month, um, try to see other people with seven. See them as perfect, just as the way they're supposed to be. See yourself as seven, um, and and know that for sure, even though we're going to screw it up all the time, God sees us as seven. And that's why the forgiveness comes as seven, and seven times seven, and seven plus seven, and 777, right? As many times as we can work the word seven in, that's what they're up to in this text, is to say that God knows who we are. We were knit in the womb. God knows 
what's going to happen to us. And it's, it's kind of like when we baptize babies. We baptize babies not knowing how they're going to grow up to screw up everything or nothing, right? But we, we declare to this baby before it has the ability to do something so horrible that we would think it's unlovable that there's nothing it could ever do as it grows up to ever separate itself from the love of God. And we also declare, though we don't always live up to it as well as God lives up to God's bargain in baptism, we declare that this child is able to be a welcome and loved part of our faith community, that we will do a good job teaching them in the faith and providing them with grace no matter how they grow up. And that doesn't always happen because sometimes fights, like in Joseph's story, um, make it really hard for us to figure out how to be family with each other. But God doesn't have that kind of baggage. Or maybe God did, but God's so wise from being a lot around all of these years that God has learned some sort of God-like maturity to like not get stuck in those things anymore. And so embrace your seven this week. Amen. Amen. The end is that the end of the Bible study because I ended kind of like it was the end of the sermon. I think it is. I think okay. that's a great place to end for this week. So thank you all so much for coming and listening and watching either this week or next week or five years from now. Thanks for joining us and for being with us. Yeah. Seven. <laughs> <laughs>